The Lurking Fear by H. P. Lovecraft. One, the shadow on the chimney. There was thunder in the air on the night I went to the deserted mansion atop Tempest Mountain to find the lurking fear. I was not alone, for foolhardiness was not then mixed with that love of the grotesque and the terrible, which has made my career a series of quests for strange horrors in literature and in life. With me were two faithful and muscular men, for whom I had sent when the time came. Men long associated with me in my ghastly explorations because of their peculiar fitness. We had started quietly from the village because of the reporters who still lingered about after the eldritch panic of a month before, the nightmare creeping death. Later, I thought, they might aid me, but I did not want them then. Would to God I had let them share the search, that I might not have had to bear the secret alone so long. To bear it alone for fear the world would call me mad, or go mad itself at the demonic implications of the thing, now that I am telling it anyway. Lest the brooding make me a maniac, I wish I had never concealed it. For I, and I only, know what manner of fear lurked on that spectral and desolate mountain. In a small motor car, we covered the miles of primeval forest and hill until the wooded ascent checked it. The country bore an aspect more than usually sinister as we viewed it by night and without the accustomed crowds of investigators. So that we were often tempted to use the acetylene headlight despite the attention it might attract. It was not a wholesome landscape after dark, and I believe I would have noticed its morbidity even had I been ignorant of the terror that stalked there. Of wild creatures, there were none. They are wise when death lives close. The ancient, lightning-scared trees seemed unnaturally large and twisted, and the other vegetation unnaturally thick and feverish, while curious mounds and hummocks in the weedy, fulgrite-pitted earth reminded me of snakes and dead men's skulls, swelled to gigantic proportions. Fear had lurked on Tempest Mountain for more than a century. This I learned at once from newspaper accounts of the catastrophe which first brought the region to the world's notice. The place is a remote, lonely elevation in that part of the Catskills where Dutch civilization once feebly and transiently penetrated, leaving behind as it receded only a few ruined mansions and a degenerate squatter population inhabiting pitiful hamlets on isolated slopes. Normal beings seldom visited the locality till the state police were formed, and even now only infrequent troopers patrol it. The fear, however, is an old tradition throughout the neighboring villages. Since it is a prime topic in the simple discourse of the poor mongrels who sometimes leave their valleys to trade hand-woven baskets for such primitive necessities as they cannot shoot, raise, or make. The lurking fear dwelt in the shunned and deserted Martens mansion, which crowned the high but gradual eminence whose liability to frequent thunderstorms gave it the name of Tempest Mountain. For over a hundred years the antique grove-circled stone house had been the subject of stories incredibly wild and monstrously hideous, stories of a silent, colossal, creeping death which stalked abroad in summer. With whimpering insistence, the squatters told tales of a demon which seized lone wayfarers after dark, either carrying them off or leaving them in a frightful state of gnawed dismemberment, while sometimes they whispered of blood trails toward the distant mansion. Some, said the thunder, called the lurking fear out of its habitation, while others said the thunder was its voice. No one outside the backwoods had believed these varying and conflicting stories, with their incoherent, extravagant descriptions of the half-glimpsed fiend. Yet not a farmer or a villager doubted that the Martens mansion was ghoulishly haunted. Local history forbade such a doubt, although no ghostly evidence was ever found by such investigators as had visited the building after some especially vivid tale of the squatters. 
Grandmothers told strange myths of the Martens spectre, myths concerning the Martens family itself, its queer hereditary dissimilarity of eyes, its long, unnatural annals, and the murder which had cursed it. The terror which brought me to the scene was a sudden and portentous confirmation of the mountaineer's wildest legends. One summer night, after a thunderstorm of unprecedented violence, the countryside was aroused by a squatter stampede, which no mere delusion could create. The pitiful throngs of natives shrieked and whined of the unnameable horror which had descended upon them, and they were not doubted. They had not seen it, but had heard such cries from one of their hamlets that they knew a creeping death had come. In the morning, citizens and state troopers followed the shuddering mountaineers to the place where they said the death had come. Death was indeed there. The ground under one of the squatters' villages had caved in after a lightning stroke, destroying several of the malodorous shanties. But upon this property damage was superimposed an organic devastation which paled it to insignificance. Of a possible 75 natives who had inhabited this spot, not one living specimen was visible. The disordered earth was covered with blood and human debris, bespeaking too vividly the ravages of demon teeth and talons. Yet no visible trail led away from the carnage. That some hideous animal must be the cause, everyone quickly agreed. Nor did any tongue now revive the charge that such cryptic deaths formed merely the sordid murders common in decadent communities. That charge was revived only when about 25 of the estimated population were found missing from the dead. And even then it was hard to explain the murder of 50 by half that number. But the fact remained that on a summer night a bolt had come out of the heavens and left a dead village whose corpses were horribly mangled, chewed and clawed. The excited countryside immediately connected the horror with the haunted Martens mansion, though the localities were over three miles apart. The troopers were more skeptical, including the mansion only casually in their investigations, and dropping it altogether when they found it thoroughly deserted. Country and village people, however, canvassed the place with infinite care, overturning everything in the house sounding ponds and brooks, beating down bushes and ransacking the nearby forests. All was in vain. The death that had come had left no trace save destruction itself. By the second day of the search, the affair was fully treated by the newspapers, whose reporters overran Tempest Mountain. They described it in much detail, and with many interviews to elucidate the horror's history as told by local grand arms. I followed the accounts languidly at first, for I am a connoisseur in horrors, but after a week I detected an atmosphere which stirred me oddly, so that on August 5th, 1921, I registered among the reporters who crowded the hotel at Lefert's Corner, nearest village to Tempest Mountain, and acknowledged headquarters of the searchers. Three weeks more and the dispersal of the reporters left me free to begin a terrible exploration based on the minute inquiries and surveying with which I had meanwhile busied myself. So on this summer night, while distant thunder rumbled, I left a silent motor car and tramped with two armed companions up the last mound-covered reaches of Tempest Mountain, casting the beams of an electric torch on the spectral grey walls that began to appear through giant oaks ahead. In this morbid night solitude and feeble shifting illumination, the vast box-like pile displayed obscure hints of terror which day could not uncover. Yet I did not hesitate, since I had come with fierce resolution to test an idea. I believed that the thunder called the death demon out of some fearsome secret place and be that demon solid entity or vaporous pestilence, I meant to see it. I had thoroughly searched the ruin before, hence knew my plan well, choosing as the seat of my vigil the old room of Jan Martens, whose murder looms so great in the rural legends. 
I felt subtly that the apartment of this ancient victim was best for my purposes. The chamber, measuring about twenty feet square, contained, like the other rooms, some rubbish which had once been furniture. It lay on the second story on the southeast corner of the house, and had an immense east window and narrow south window, both devoid of panes or shutters. Opposite the large window was an enormous Dutch fireplace, with scriptural tiles representing the prodigal son, and opposite the narrow window was a spacious bed built into the wall. As the tree-muffled thunder grew louder, I arranged my plan's details. First, I fastened side by side to the ledge of the large window three rope ladders which I had brought with me. I knew they reached a suitable spot on the grass outside, for I had tested them. Then the three of us dragged from another room a wide four-poster bedstead, crowding it laterally against the window. Having strewn it with fir boughs, all now rested on it with drawn automatics, two relaxing while the third watched. From whatever direction the demon might come, our potential escape was provided. If it came from within the house, we had the window ladders. If from the outside, the door and the stairs. We did not think, judging from precedent, that it would pursue us far, even at worst. I watched from midnight to one o'clock, when in spite of the sinister house, the unprotected window and the approaching thunder and lightning, I felt singularly drowsy. I was between my two companions, George Bennett being toward the window, and William Toby toward the fireplace. Bennett was asleep, having apparently felt the same anomalous drowsiness which affected me. So I designated Toby for the next watch, although even he was nodding. It is curious how intently I had been watching that fireplace. The increasing thunder must have affected my dreams, for in the brief time I slept there came to me apocalyptic visions. Once I partly awaked, probably because the sleeper toward the window had restlessly flung an arm across my chest. I was not sufficiently awake to see whether Toby was attending to his duties as sentinel, but felt a distinct anxiety on that score. Never before had the presence of evil so poignantly oppressed me. Later I must have dropped to sleep again, for it was out of a phantasmal chaos that my mind leaped when the night grew hideous with shrieks beyond anything in my former experience or imagination. In that shrieking, the inmost soul of human fear and agony clawed hopelessly and insanely at the ebony gates of oblivion. I awoke to red madness and the mockery of diabolism, as farther and farther down inconceivable vistas that phobic and crystalline anguish retreated and reverberated. There was no light, but I knew from the empty space at my right that Toby was gone. God alone knew whither. Across my chest still lay the heavy arm of the sleeper at my left. Then came the devastating stroke of lightning which shook the whole mountain, lit the darkest crypts of the hoary grove, and splintered the patriarch of the twisted trees. In the demon flash of a monstrous fireball the sleeper started up suddenly, while the glare from beyond the window threw its shadow vividly upon the chimney above the fireplace, from which my eyes had never strayed. That I am still alive and sane is a marvel I cannot fathom. I cannot fathom it, for the shadow on that chimney was not that of George Bennett, or of any other human creature, but a blasphemous abnormality from hell's nethermost craters, a nameless, shapeless abomination which no mind could fully grasp, and no pen even partly describe. In another second I was alone in the accursed mansion, shivering and gibbering. George Bennett and William Toby had left no trace, not even of a struggle. They were never heard of again. 2. A Passer in the Storm For days after that hideous experience in the forest swathed mansion, I lay nervously exhausted in my hotel room at Lefter's Corners. I do not remember exactly how I managed to reach the motor car, start it, and slip unobserved back to the village, for I retain no distinct impression save of wild-armed titan trees, demoniac mutterings of thunder, and Caronian shadows athwart the low mounds that dotted and streaked the region. 
As I shivered and brooded on the casting of that brain-blasting shadow, I knew that I had at last pried out one of Earth's supreme horrors, one of those nameless blights of outer voids whose faint demon scratchings we sometimes hear on the farthest rim of space, yet from which our own finite vision has given us merciful immunity. The shadow I had seen I hardly dared to analyze or identify. Something had lain between me and the window that night, but I shuddered whenever I could not cast off the instinct to classify it. If it had only snarled or bayed or laughed titteringly, even that would have relieved the abysmal hideousness. But it was so silent. It had rested a heavy arm or foreleg on my chest. Obviously it was organic or had once been organic. Jan Martens, whose room I had invaded, was buried in the graveyard near the mansion. I must find Bennett and Toby if they lived. Why had it picked them, and left me for the last? Drowsiness is so stifling, and dreams are so horrible. In a short time I realized that I must tell my story to someone, or break down completely. I had already decided not to abandon the quest for the lurking fear, for in my rash ignorance it seemed to me that uncertainty was worse than enlightenment, however terrible the latter might prove to be. Accordingly, I resolved in my mind the best course to pursue, whom to select for my confidences, and how to track down the thing which had obliterated two men and cast a nightmare shadow. My chief acquaintances at Lefert's Corners had been the affable reporters, of whom several still remained to collect final echoes of the tragedy. It was from these that I determined to choose a colleague, and the more I reflected, the more my preference inclined toward one Arthur Munro, a dark, lean man of about thirty-five, whose education, taste, intelligence, and temperament all seemed to mark him as one not bound to conventional ideas and experiences. On an afternoon in early September, Arthur Munro listened to my story. I saw from the beginning that he was both interested and sympathetic, and when I had finished, he analysed and discussed the thing with the greatest shrewdness and judgement. His advice, moreover, was eminently practical, for he recommended a postponement of operations at the Martinez Mansion, until we might become fortified with more detailed historical and geographical data. On his initiative, we combed the countryside for information regarding the terrible Martens family, and discovered a man who possessed a marvellously illuminating ancestral diary. We also talked at length with such of the mountain mongrels as had not fled from the terror and confusion to remoter slopes, and arranged to precede our culminating task, the exhaustive and definitive examination of the mansion in the light of its detailed history, with an equally exhaustive and definitive examination of spots associated with the various tragedies of squatter legend. The results of this examination were not at first very enlightening, though our tabulation of them seemed to reveal a fairly significant trend, namely that the number of reported horrors was by far the greatest in areas either comparatively near the avoided house or connected with it by stretches of the morbidly overnourished forest. There were, it is true, exceptions. Indeed, the horror which had caught the world's ear had happened in a treeless space remote alike from the mansion and from any connecting woods. As to the nature and appearance of the lurking fear, nothing could be gained from the scared and witless shanty dwellers. In the same breath they called it a snake and a giant, a thunder devil and a bat, a vulture and a walking tree. We did, however, deem ourselves justified in assuming that it was a living organism highly susceptible to electrical storms, and although certain of the stories suggested wings, we believed that its aversion for open spaces made land locomotion a more probable theory. The only thing really incompatible with the latter view was the rapidity with which the creature must have travelled in order to perform all the deeds attributed to it. When we came to know the squatters better, we found them curiously likable in many ways. Simple animals they were, 
gently descending the evolutionary scale because of their unfortunate ancestry and stultifying isolation. They feared outsiders, but slowly grew accustomed to us, finally helping vastly when we beat down all the thickets and tore out all the partitions of the mansion in our search for the lurking fear. When we asked them to help us find Bennett and Toby, they were truly distressed, for they wanted to help us, yet knew that these victims had gone as wholly out of the world as their own missing people. That great numbers of them had actually been killed and removed, just as the wild animals had long been exterminated. We were, of course, thoroughly convinced, and we waited apprehensively for further tragedies to occur. By the middle of October, we were puzzled by our lack of progress. Owing to the clear nights, no demoniac aggressions had taken place, and the completeness of our vain searches of house and country almost drove us to regard the lurking fear as a non-material agency. We feared that the cold weather would come on and halt our explorations, for all agreed that the demon was generally quiet in winter. Thus there was a kind of haste and desperation in our last daylight canvas of the horror-visited hamlet, a hamlet now deserted because of the squatter's fears. The ill-fated squatter hamlet had borne no name, but had long stood in a sheltered though treeless cleft between two elevations called respectively Cone Mountain and Maple Hill. It was closer to Maple Hill than to Cone Mountain, some of the crude abodes indeed being dugouts on the side of the former eminence. Geographically, it lay about two miles northwest of the base of Tempest Mountain, and three miles from the Oak Girt Mansion. Of the distance between the hamlet and the mansion, fully two miles and a quarter on the hamlet side was entirely open country, the plain being a fairly level character, save for some of the low snake-like mounds, and having as vegetation only grass and scattered weeds. Considering this topography, we had finally concluded that the demon must have come by way of Cone Mountain, a wooded southern prolongation of which ran to within a short distance of the westernmost spur of Tempest Mountain. The upheaval of ground we traced conclusively to a landslide from Maple Hill, a tall, lone, splintered tree on whose side had been the striking point of the thunderbolt which summoned the fiend. As for the twentieth time or more, Arthur Munro and I went minutely over every inch of the violated village, we were filled with a certain discouragement, coupled with vague and novel fears. It was actually uncanny, even when frightful and uncanny things were common, to encounter so blankly clueless a scene after such overwhelming occurrences. And we moved about beneath the leaden darkening sky with that tragic, directionless seal which results from a combined sense of futility and necessity of action. Our care was gravely minute. Every cottage was again entered, every hillside dug out, again searched for bodies, every thorny foot of adjacent slope again scanned for dens and caves, but all without result. And yet, as I have said, vague new fears hovered menacingly over us, as if giant bat-winged griffins squatted invisibly on the mountaintops and leered with Abaddon eyes that looked on transcosmic gulfs. As the afternoon advanced, it became increasingly difficult to see, and we heard the rumble of a thunderstorm gathering over Tempest Mountain. This sound in such a locality naturally stirred us, though less than it would have done at night. As it was, we hoped desperately that the storm would last until well after dark. And with that hope, turned from our aimless hillside searching toward the nearest inhabited hamlet to gather a body of squatters as helpers in the investigation. Timid as they were, a few of the younger men were sufficiently inspired by our protective leadership to promise such help. We had hardly more than turned, however, when there descended such a blinding sheet of torrential rain that shelter became imperative. The extreme, almost nocturnal darkness of the sky caused us to stumble sadly, but guided by the frequent flashes of lightning and by our minute knowledge of the hamlet, we soon reached the least porous cabin of the lot. An heterogeneous combination of logs and boards 
whose still existing door and single tiny window both faced Maple Hill. Barring the door after us, against the fury of the wind and rain, we put in place the crude window shutter, which our frequent searches had taught us where to find. It was dismal, sitting there on rickety boxes in the pitchy darkness, but we smoked pipes and occasionally flashed our pocket lamps about. Now and then we could see lightning through the cracks in the wall. The afternoon was so incredibly dark that each flash was extremely vivid. The stormy vigil reminded me shudderingly of my ghastly night on Tempest Mountain. My mind turned to that odd question which had kept recurring ever since the nightmare thing had happened, and again I wondered why the demon approaching the three watchers either from the window or the interior had begun with the men on each side and left the middle man till the last when the titan fireball had scared it away. Why had it not taken its victims in natural order? with myself second from whichever direction it had approached. With what manner of far-reaching tentacles did it pray? Or did it know that I was the leader and save me for a fate worse than that of my companions? In the midst of these reflections, as if dramatically arranged to intensify them, there fell nearby a terrific bolt of lightning followed by the sound of sliding earth. At the same time, the wolfish wind rose to demoniac crescendos of ululation. We were sure that the lone tree on Maple Hill had been struck again, and Munro rose from his box and went to the tiny window to ascertain the damage. When he took down the shutter, the wind and rain howled deafeningly in, so that I could not hear what he said, but I waited while he leaned out and tried to fathom nature's pandemonium. Gradually, a calming of the wind and dispersal of the unusual darkness told of the storm's passing, I had hoped it would last into the night to help our quest, but a furtive sunbeam from a knothole behind me removed the likelihood of such a thing. Suggesting to Munro that we had better get some light even if more showers came, I unbarred and opened the crude door. The ground outside was a singular mass of mud and pools, with fresh heaps of earth from the slight landslide, but I saw nothing to justify the interest which kept my companion silently leaning out of the window. Crossing to where he leaned, I touched his shoulder, but he did not move. Then, as I playfully shook him and turned him around, I felt the strangling tendrils of a cancerous horror whose roots reached into illimitable pass and fathomless abysms of the night that broods beyond time. For Arthur Munro was dead, and on what remained of his chewed and gouged head There was no longer a face. 3. What the Red Glare Meant On the tempest-wracked night of November 8, 1921, with a lantern which cast carnal shadows, I stood digging alone and idiotically in the grave of Jan Martens. I had begun to dig in the afternoon because a thunderstorm was brewing, and now that it was dark and the storm had burst above the maniacally thick foliage, I was glad. I believe that my mind was partly unhinged by events since August 5th. The demon shadow in the mansion, the general strain and disappointment and the thing that occurred at the hamlet in an October storm. After that thing I had dug a grave for, one whose death I could not understand. I knew that others could not understand either, so let them think Arthur Munro had wandered away. They searched but found nothing. The squatters might have understood, but I dared not frighten them more. I myself seemed strangely callous. That shock at the mansion had done something to my brain, and I could think only of the quest for a horror now grown to cataclysmic stature in my imagination. A quest which the fate of Arthur Munro made me vow to keep silent and solitary. The scene of my excavations would alone have been enough to unnerve any ordinary man. Baleful primal trees of unholy size, age, and grotesqueness leered above me like the pillars of some hellish druidic temple, muffling the thunder, hushing the cloying wind, and admitting but little rain. Beyond the scarred trunks in the background, illumined by faint flashes of filtered lightning, rose the damp, ivied stones of the deserted mansion, while somewhat nearer, 
was the abandoned Dutch garden, whose walks and beds were polluted by a white, fungus-fetid, overnourished vegetation that never saw full daylight. And nearest of all was the graveyard, where deformed trees tossed insane branches as their roots displaced unhallowed slabs and sucked venom from what lay below. Now and then, beneath the brown pall of leaves that rotted and festered in the antediluvian forest darkness, I could trace the sinister outlines of some of those low mounds which characterized the lightning-pierced region. History had led me to this archaic grave. History, indeed, was all I had after everything else ended in mocking Satanism. I now believed that the lurking fear was no material thing, but a wolf-fanged ghost that rode the midnight lightning, and I believed because of the masses of local tradition I had unearthed in my search with Arthur Munro, that the ghost was that of Jan Martens, who died in 1762. That is why I was digging idiotically in his grave. The Martens mansion was built in 1670 by Gerrit Martens, a wealthy New Amsterdam merchant who disliked the changing order under British rule and had constructed this magnificent domicile on a remote woodland summit whose untrodden solitude and unusual scenery pleased him. The only substantial disappointment encountered in this site was that which concerned the prevalence of violent thunderstorms in summer. When selecting the hill and building his mansion, Mynheer Martens had laid these frequent natural outbursts to some peculiarity of the year but in time he perceived that the locality was especially liable to such phenomena. At length, having found these storms injurious to his health, he fitted up a cellar into which he could retreat from their wildest pandemonium. Of Gerrit Martens's descendants, less is known than of himself, since they were all reared in hatred of the English civilization and trained to shun such of the colonists that accepted it. Their life was exceedingly secluded, and people declared that their isolation had made them heavy of speech and comprehension. In appearance, all were marked by a peculiar inherited dissimilarity of eyes, one generally being blue and the other brown. Their social contacts grew fewer and fewer, till at last they took to intermarrying with the numerous menial class about the estate. Many of the crowded family degenerated, moved across the valley, and merged with the mongrel population, which was later to produce the pitiful squatters. The rest had stuck sullenly to their ancestral mansion, becoming more and more clannish and taciturn, yet developing a nervous responsiveness to the frequent thunderstorms. Most of this information reached the outside world through young Jan Martens, who, from some kind of restlessness, joined the colonial army when news of the Albany Convention reached Tempest Mountain. He was the first of Gerrit's descendants to see much of the world, and when he returned in 1760, after six years of campaigning, he was hated as an outsider by his father, uncles and brothers, in spite of his dissimilar Martens eyes. No longer could he share the peculiarities and prejudices of the Martenses, while the very mountain thunderstorms failed to intoxicate him as they had before. Instead, his surroundings depressed him, and he frequently wrote to a friend in Albany of plans to leave the paternal roof. In the spring of 1763, Jonathan Gifford, the Albany friend of Jan Martens, became worried by his correspondent's silence, especially in view of the conditions and quarrels at the Martens mansion. Determined to visit Jan in person, he went into the mountains on horseback. His diary states that he reached Tempest Mountain on September 20, finding the mansion in great decrepitude. The sullen, odd-eyed Martenses, whose unclean animal aspect shocked him, told him in broken gutturals that Jan was dead. He had, they insisted, been struck by lightning the autumn before, and now lay buried behind the neglected sunken gardens. They showed the visitor the grave, barren and devoid of markers. Something in the Martenses' manner gave Gifford a feeling of repulsion and suspicion, and a week later he returned with spade and mattock to explore the sepulchral spot. He found what he expected, 
a skull, crushed cruelly as if by savage blows. So returning to Albany, he openly charged the Martenses with the murder of their kinsmen. Legal evidence was lacking, but the story spread rapidly round the countryside, and from that time the Martenses were ostracized by the world. No one would deal with them, and their distant manor was shunned as an accursed place. Somehow they managed to live on independently by the products of their estate, for occasional lights glimpsed from faraway hills attested their continued presence. These lights were seen as late as 1810, but toward the last they became very infrequent. Meanwhile, there grew about the mansion and the mountain a body of diabolic legendary. The place was avoided with double deciduousness and invested with every whispered myth tradition could supply. It remained unvisited till 1816, when the continued absence of lights was noticed by the squatters. At that time a party made investigations, finding the house deserted and partly in ruins. There were no skeletons about, so that departure rather than death was inferred. The clan seemed to have left several years before, and improvised penthouses showed how numerous it had grown prior to its migration. Its cultural level had fallen very low, as proved by decaying furniture and scattered silverware, which must have been long abandoned when its owners left. But though the dreaded Martenses were gone, fear of the haunted house continued and grew very acute when new and strange stories arose among the mountain descendants. There it stood, deserted, feared, and linked with the vengeful ghost of Nyan Martens. There it still stood, on the night I dug in Jan Martens's grave. I have described my protracted digging as idiotic, and such it indeed was in object and method. The coffin of Jan Martens had soon been unearthed. It now held only dust and nitra. But, in my fury to exhume his ghost, I delved irrationally and clumsily down beneath where he had lain. God knows what I expected to find. I only felt that I was digging in the grave of a man whose ghost stalked by night. It is impossible to say what monstrous depth I had attained when my spade, and soon my feet, broke through the ground beneath. The event, under the circumstances, was tremendous, for in the existence of a subterranean space here, my mad theories had terrible confirmation. My slight fall had extinguished the lantern, but I produced an electric pocket lamp and viewed the small horizontal tunnel which led away indefinitely in both directions. It was amply large enough for a man to wriggle through, and though no sane person would have tried it at that time, I forgot danger, reason and cleanliness in my single-minded fever to unearth the lurking fear. Choosing the direction toward the house, I scrambled recklessly into the narrow burrow, squirming ahead blindly and rapidly, and flashing but seldom the lamp I kept before me. What language can describe the spectacle of a man lost in infinitely abysmal earth, pawing, twisting, wheezing, scrambling madly through sunken convolutions of immemorial blackness, without an idea of time, safety, direction, or definite object? There is something hideous in it, but that is what I did. I did it for so long that life faded to a far memory, and I became one with the moles and grubs of nighted depths. Indeed, it was only by accident that after interminable writhings, I jarred my forgotten electric lamp alight, so that it shone eerily along the burrow of caked loam that stretched and curved ahead. I had been scrambling in this way for some time, so that my battery had burned very low when the passage suddenly inclined sharply upward, altering my mode of progress. And as I raised my glance, it was without preparation that I saw glistening in the distance two demoniac reflections of my expiring lamp, two reflections glowing with a baneful and unmistakable effulgence and provoking maddeningly nebulous memories. I stopped automatically though lacking the brain to retreat. The eyes approached, yet of the thing that bore them I could distinguish only a claw. But what a claw! Then far overhead I heard a faint crashing which I recognized. It was the wild thunder of the mountain, 
raised to hysteric fury. I must have been crawling upward for some time, so that the surface was now quite near, and as the muffled thunder clattered, those eyes still stared with vacuous viciousness. Thank God I did not then know what it was, else I should have died, but I was saved by the very thunder that summoned it, for after a hideous wait there burst from the unseen outside sky one of those frequent mountainwood bolts whose aftermath I had noticed here and there as gashes of disturbed earth and fulgurites of various sizes. With cyclopean rage it tore through the soil above that damnable pit, blinding and deafening me, yet not wholly reducing me to a coma. In the chaos of sliding, shifting earth I clawed and floundered helplessly till the rain on my head steadied me, and I saw that I had come to the surface in a familiar spot, a steep, unforested place on the southwest slope of the mountain. Recurrent sheet lightnings illumined the tumbled ground and the remains of the curious low hummock which had stretched down from the wooded higher slope, but there was nothing in the chaos to show my place of egress from the lethal catacomb. My brain was as great a chaos as the earth, and as a distant red glare burst on the landscape from the south, I hardly realized the horror I had been through. But when two days later the squatters told me what the red glare meant, I felt more horror than that which the mould burrow and the claw and eyes had given. More horror because of the overwhelming implications. In a hamlet twenty miles away, an orgy of fear had followed the bolt which brought me above ground, and a nameless thing had dropped from an overhanging tree into a weak roofed cabin. It had done a deed, but the squatters had fired the cabin in frenzy before it could escape. It had been doing that deed at the very moment the earth caved in on the thing with the claw and eyes. 4. The Horror in the Eyes There can be nothing normal in the mind of one who, knowing what I knew of the horrors of Tempest Mountain, would seek alone for the fear that lurked there. That at least two of the fear's embodiments were destroyed formed but a slight guarantee of mental and physical safety in this Archeron of multiform diabolism. Yet I continued my quest with even greater zeal as events and revelations became more monstrous. When, two days after my frightful crawl through that crypt of the eyes and claw, I learned that a thing had malignly hovered twenty miles away at the same instant the eyes were glaring at me. I experienced virtual convulsions of fright. But that fright was so mixed with wonder and alluring grotesqueness that it was almost a pleasant sensation. Sometimes in the throes of a nightmare, when unseen powers whirl one over roofs of strange dead cities toward the grinning chasm of Nice, it is a relief and even a delight to shriek wildly and throw oneself voluntarily along with the hideous vortex of dream doom into whatever bottomless gulf may yawn. And so it was with the waking nightmare of Tempest Mountain. The discovery that two monsters had haunted the spot gave me ultimately a mad craving to plunge into the very earth of the accursed region and with bare hands dig out the death that leered from every inch of the poisonous soil. As soon as possible I visited the grave of Jan Martens and dug vainly where I had dug before. Some extensive cave-in had obliterated all trace of the underground passage, while the rain had washed so much earth back into the excavation that I could not tell how deeply I had dug that other day. I likewise made a difficult trip to the distant hamlet where the death creature had been burnt, and was little repaid for my trouble. In the ashes of the fateful cabin, I found several bones, but apparently none of the monsters. The squatters said the thing had had only one victim, but in this I judged them inaccurate, since besides the complete skull of a human being, there was another bony fragment which seemed certainly to have belonged to a human skull at some time. Though the rapid drop of the monster had been seen, no one could say just what the creature was like. 
those who had glimpsed it called it simply a devil. Examining the great tree where it had lurked, I could discern no distinctive marks. I tried to find some trail into the black forest, but on this occasion could not stand the sight of those morbidly large bowls, or of those vast serpent-like roots that twisted so malevolently before they sank into the earth. My next step was to re-examine with microscopic care the deserted hamlet where death had come most abundantly, and where Arthur Munro had seen something he never lived to describe. Though my vain previous searches had been exceedingly minute, I now had new data to test, for my horrible grave crawl convinced me that at least one of the phases of the monstrosity had been an underground creature. This time, on the 14th of November, my quest concerned itself mostly with the slopes of Cone Mountain and Maple Hill, where they overlooked the unfortunate hamlet and I gave particular attention to the loose earth of the landslide region on the latter eminence. The afternoon of my search brought nothing to light, and dusk came as I stood on Maple Hill looking down at the hamlet and across the valley to Tempest Mountain. There had been a gorgeous sunset, and now the moon came up, nearly full and shedding a silver flood over the plain, the distant mountainside and the curious low mounds that rose here and there. It was a peaceful Arcadian scene, but knowing what it hid, I hated it. I hated the mocking moon, the hypocritical plain, the festering mountain, and those sinister mounds. Everything seemed to me tainted with a loathsome contagion and inspired by a noxious alliance with distorted hidden powers. Presently, as I gazed abstractedly at the moonlit panorama, my eye became attracted by something singular in the nature and arrangement of a certain topographical element. Without having any exact knowledge of geology, I had from the first been interested in the odd mounds and hummocks of the region. I had noticed that they were pretty widely distributed around Tempest Mountain, though less numerous on the plain than near the hilltop itself, where prehistoric glaciation had doubtless found feebler opposition to its striking and fantastic caprices. Now, in the light of that low moon which cast long, weird shadows, it struck me forcibly that the various points and lines of the mound system had a peculiar relation to the summit of Tempest Mountain. That summit was undeniably a center from which the lines or rows of points radiated indefinitely and irregularly, as if the unwholesome Martens mansion had thrown visible tentacles of terror. The idea of such tentacles gave me an unexplained thrill, and I stopped to analyze my reason for believing these mounds glacial phenomena. The more I analyzed, the less I believed, and against my newly opened mind, there began to beat grotesque and horrible analogies, based on superficial aspects and upon my experience beneath the earth. Before I knew it, I was uttering frenzied and disjointed words to myself. My God! Molehills! The damn place must be honeycomb! How many? That night at the mansion! They took Bennett and Toby first, on each side of us! Then I was digging frantically into the mound which had stretched nearest me, digging desperately, shiveringly, but almost jubilantly, digging and at last shrieking aloud with some unplaced emotion as I came upon a tunnel or burrow, just like the one through which I had crawled on that other demoniac night. After that, I recall running, spade in hand, a hideous run across moonlit mound-marked meadows, and through deceased, precipitous abysses of haunted hillside forest, leaping, screaming, panting, bounding towards the terrible Martens mansion. I recall digging unreasoningly in all parts of the briar-choked cellar, digging to find the core and center of that malignant universe of mounds. And then I recall how I laughed when I stumbled on the passageway, the hole at the base of the old chimney, where the thick weeds grew and cast queer shadows in the light of the lone candle I had happened to have with me. What still remained down in that hell hive, lurking and waiting for the thunder to arouse it, I did not know. Two had been killed. Perhaps that had finished it. 
but still there remained that burning determination to reach the innermost secret of the fear, which I had once more come to deem definite, material, and organic. My indecisive speculation whether to explore the passage alone and immediately with my pocket light, or to try to assemble a band of squatters for the quest, was interrupted after a time by a sudden rush of wind from outside, which blew out the candle and left me in stark blackness. The moon no longer shone through the chinks and apertures above me, and with a sense of fateful alarm I heard the sinister and significant rumble of approaching thunder. A confusion of associated ideas possessed my brain, leading me to grope back toward the farthest corner of the cellar. My eyes, however, never turned away from the horrible opening at the base of the chimney, and I began to get glimpses of the crumbling bricks and unhealthy weeds as faint glows of lightning penetrated the woods outside and illuminated the chinks in the upper wall. Every second I was consumed with a mixture of fear and curiosity. What would the storm call forth? Or was there anything left for it to call? Guided by a lightning flash, I settled myself down behind a dense clump of vegetation, through which I could see the opening without being seen. If heaven is merciful, it will some day efface from my consciousness the sight that I saw, and let me live my last years in peace. I cannot sleep at night now, and have to take opiates when it thunders. The thing came abruptly and unannounced, a demon, rat-like, scurrying from pits remote and unimaginable, a hellish panting and stifled grunting, and then from that opening beneath the chimney, a burst of multitudinous and leprous life, a loathsome night-spawn flood of organic corruption, more devastatingly hideous than the blackest conjurations of mortal madness and morbidity. Seething, stewing, surging, Bubbling like serpent slime, it rolled up and out of that yawning hole, spreading like a septic contagion and streaming from the cellar at every point of egress, streaming out to scatter through the accursed midnight forest and strew fear, madness and death. God knows how many there were. There must have been thousands. To see the stream of them in that faint intermittent lightning was shocking. When they had thinned out enough to be glimpsed as separate organisms, I saw that they were dwarfed, deformed, hairy devils or apes, monstrous and diabolic caricatures of the monkey tribe. They were so hideously silent, there was hardly a squeal when one of the last stragglers turned with the skill of long practice to make a meal in a custom fashion on a weaker companion. Others snapped up what it left and ate with slavering relish. Then, in spite of my days of fright and disgust, my morbid curiosity triumphed, and as the last of the monstrosities oozed up alone from that nether world of unknown nightmare, I drew my automatic pistol and shot it under the cover of the thunder. Shrieking, slithering torrential shadows of red, viscous madness, chasing one another through endless, ensanguined corridors of purple, fulgurous sky, formless phantasms and kaleidoscopic mutations of ghoulish remembered scene. Forests of monstrous overnourished oaks with serpent roots twisting and sucking unnameable juices from an earth verminous with millions of cannibal devils. Mound-like tentacles groping from underground nuclei of polypus perversion. Insane lightning over malignant, ivied walls and demon arcades choked with fungus vegetation. Heaven be thanked for the instinct which led me unconscious to places where men dwell, to the peaceful village that slept under the calm stars of clearing skies. I had recovered enough in a week to send to Albany for a gang of men to blow up the Martens mansion and the entire top of Tempest Mountain with dynamite stop up all the discoverable mound burrows and destroy certain overnourished trees whose very existence seemed an insult to sanity. I could sleep a little after they had done this, but the true test will never come as long as I remember that nameless secret of the lurking fear. The thing will haunt me, for who can say the extermination is complete, 
and that analogous phenomena do not exist all over the world? Who can, with my knowledge, think of the Earth's unknown caverns without a nightmare dread of future possibilities? I cannot see a well or subway entrance without shuddering. Why cannot the doctors give me something to make me sleep, or truly calm my brain when it thunders? What I saw in the glow of my flashlight after I shot the unspeakable straggling object was so simple that almost a minute elapsed before I understood and went delirious. The object was nauseous, a filthy whitish gorilla thing with sharp yellow fangs and matted fur. It was the ultimate product of mammalian degeneration, the frightful outcome of isolated spawning, multiplication and cannibal nutrition above and below the ground. The embodiment of all the snarling chaos, grinning fear that lurk behind life. It had looked at me as it died, and its eyes had the same odd quality that marked those other eyes which had stared at me underground and excited cloudy recollections. One eye was blue, the other brown. They were the dissimilar Martens eyes of the old legends, and I knew in one inundating cataclysm of voiceless horror what had become of that vanished family, the terrible and thunder-crazed house of Martens.